Okay. Um, now that we have started the recording, I do want to um, give this warning. Um, so this webinar does involve uh, audio and video recording. Um, so this is going live on YouTube, um, as well as if you ask a question, um, your name as it appears on Zoom, as well as possibly your profile picture that you may have on Zoom um, may appear on YouTube. If you would not want that to happen, um, just please change your name on Zoom for this meeting to um, something that you would be okay sharing on YouTube. So maybe like initials or just your first name or anything like that and change your profile picture if you wish to, okay? So that's just a warning for everybody, okay? Um, quick introduction as people are still coming in. Um, this is your first lecture. My name is Mark Abrahmanov. Um, I'm an undergraduate um, graduate of Stony Brook University. Um, my MCAT date was this January and I scored a 520 um, with my score breakdown shown. Um, my email, if you ever want to get in contact with me about a question or anything else that you wanted to ask one-on-one. -on -one. Um, description of the course, it's 15 weeks. I believe this is week eight. Um, three lectures per week, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. This is the first of this week. One off hours um, on Sundays. Um, all lectures and off hours are 8.30, begin at 8.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Um, we'll be covering most of the high steel BEMCAT content, not all, but most of it. Um, and if you have any further questions about any more specific things, please feel free to come to off hours on Sundays for it, okay? Or the other option is um, group me. So we have a group me, which is like group chat, um, which has all of the lecture recording links and PowerPoints posted. As I mentioned, the recording is being put on YouTube and the links and the PowerPoints are posted um, on a Google Drive folder, but those will be shared um, at the end of each week on this group me. Uh, we'll also be posting any updates or changes to scheduling there or any, um, any news about our program that you should know. Um, it's also a really easy way to get a hold of me or any of the other tutors. Um, if you have any questions about anything MCAT related, um, we also have plenty of other students there um, that they may have answers um, to questions that you have either in how to study or based on content. Okay, so I would highly recommend joining this group chat and um, the link will be posted in the chat. Um, Chris, the other tutor here, um, will be posting it in the chat later. Um, so, as I mentioned today, we're, we're going to be covering uh, mostly reactions, kinetics, equilibrium. Um, so our learning objectives are we want to review stoichiometry, balancing of equations, and determining oxidation number. I don't expect that'll take very long. That should be review for most of you um, from even um, from undergraduate and from high school, but I will go over it just to be sure. Um, we want to understand what equilibrium means and how equilibrium is maintained in a reaction. We also want to understand chemical kinetics and rate laws, right? And we want to um, know the equations for equilibrium constant, rate determination, and the difference between um, constants, okay? All right, so moving on to the content. First, like I mentioned, we'll be covering stoichiometry, which should be reviewed, but we'll go over it quickly. So um, the first step to any chemical reaction is you have to uh, make sure that chemical reaction is balanced, right? Uh, what does balanced mean? Well, a balanced reaction is a reaction that has the same number of molecules on the left side of this arrow and on the right side, right? So if you look at these two, um, this reaction, these two um, sides, they're obviously not balanced because you notice there's six carbons on this side and only one carbon on this side, right? You know, you can't create or destroy matter. So those carbons had to end up somewhere, right? Um, so they couldn't have just disappeared as this reaction is progressing. So what this means is that you actually have to balance it by making it like this, right? You have to multiply this whole CO2 by six to make six carbons, right? Now you have six carbons on the left, six carbons on the right. The carbons are balanced. Then we look at the next molecule, which is H, 12 H's on the left, um, only two on the right. Again, we have to do the same thing. 12 H's on the left, 12 H's on the right. Then we look at oxygen. We have six here, two here, that's eight. Whereas, only, whereas we have um, 12 here, 
six here, that's 18, right? So what we can do is just do this, right? Now we have 12 plus six, 18 on the left, 18 on the right. Essentially, all we're really trying to do is just making sure all of the molecules that are on the left are on in the right, right? Because we don't want anything to get created or destroyed, okay? So that's how balancing works as the basic idea, right? And this is just showing what I um, wrote before, right? This is the balanced equation of a very common reaction that you'll see glucose plus ox uh, oxygen to carbon dioxide and water, the burning of glucose um, to get, and you see ATP energy on the right side as well. That's a um, very basic principle of how our bodies make energy, right? You burn glucose. But the goal here is number of atoms of each element must be equal on both sides, right? Um, next, we want to talk about oxidation number, which is also fairly um, simple. Um, oxidation number refers to the charge on each molecule in a compound. So for example, um, this compound, Fe2O3, has two different um, molecules as an Fe and an O, right? Two different components that make it up. Um, the way we usually do this um, is there are some common oxidation numbers, which is elements that always have the same um, charge, no matter which compound they're in. Um, so some common examples are co uh, column one elements in the periodic table, like sodium, potassium, et cetera, um, cesium, anything like that. Column two um, elements like uh, magnesium, calcium, um, those are usually plus two, uh, whereas column one is plus one. I'm not sure if I mentioned that, plus one. Column two is plus two. Uh, oxygen is pretty much always minus two, except when it's bound to fluorine, but you won't really see that on the MCAN. That's a very, very rare situation. And um, usually halogens like um, chlorine, fluorine are minus one, right? So if we know the overall charge of a compound, so for example, let's say this had an overall charge of zero, and if they don't give you a charge, that means it's uh, usually charge zero, um, right? So they give you the overall charge of zero. You know that each oxygen has a charge of minus two. This has minus six, right? The charge of all of the oxygens in this compound are minus six, but you know that this compound overall is zero. So they may, what they may ask you to do is just find what the oxidation number of iron, Fe, is in this case. And the oxidation number of iron and a lot of the um, transition metals in particular, they, unlike these common oxidation numbers, they vary from compound to compound. So in this case, iron, um, since there's two irons, it has to make minus six. Each iron, together iron has to be six plus. So that means between the two irons, each iron is three plus. Right, and this is called um, Fe3. And it's written like this, it's the Roman numeral three, right? And you may also see Fe4. So commonly you'll also see Fe4, which is iron with four plus with an oxidation number of four, right? Like I mentioned, a lot of the transition metals have um, various oxidation states they could take depending on which compound they are in, right? And it's usually those that you'll be actually looking for rather than something like oxygen, which you already know the answer to before you even look at the problem. Okay, highly recommend uh, remembering these uh, common oxidation numbers. They're not very hard um, because the column one is plus one, column two is plus two. Halogens are the last column other than the noble gases. So they're the second to last column actually, minus one. Oxygen is one column before that and it's uh, minus two. Um, and actually here's the periodic table. So these guys are all plus one. These guys are all plus two. Usually um, these are minus one. Um, I don't want to say that these are usually minus two. Oxygen is minus two, but sulfur is not always anything. So just remember oxygen. Um, actually, like for example, in this case, right? Um, uh, like I mentioned, sodium, you know, commonly is plus one. Two sodiums, that's a plus two. Oxygen, minus two. There's four, so that's minus eight. Assuming this is overall um, neutral, you have a minus eight and a plus two. How do you get from, that makes a minus six. How do you get from minus six to neutral? Well, this sulfur actually has to be plus six, 
right? And that's very simple. Sulfur's plus six. And it makes sense if you guys remember valence electrons, um, you wanna either have a full or an empty shell, right? You don't wanna have um, a half filled valence shell. Valence shells usually have eight electrons. Um, so something like um, oxygen can be minus two to fill it up and become a noble gas, right? Sulfur can also become a noble gas, uh, noble gas like by filling up its shell and becoming minus two, it can become like argon or it can just lose six and become like neon, okay? It's just something you may um, remember. Um, I know I went through that very fast, but I hope it was mostly a review for you guys. Do you have any questions before we move on to our next um, section, which I'll um, cover it a lot more in depth? Just on what we've covered so far with the oxidation numbers and um, balancing equations. Okay, well, if nothing else, then I'll move on. Next, um, we want to cover equilibrium, right? So equilibrium, um, first, what is equilibrium? So equilibrium means that a chemical reaction is perfectly balanced, but not in the way that I was just talking about with balancing the equation in terms of number of molecules, but rather it's, um, it's in a state where the reactants and products are in a uh, balanced state as, uh, I guess, if you want to think about it, as the world sees fit, right? And that can depend on many, many different factors, right? Um, it's a little bit hard to explain in words, and I'm sure you'll see what I mean. Um, so essentially what it means is that the forward and the reverse reactions are happening at the same rate, and there's actually no overall change in over time. Um, again, uh, an important note, this does not mean that the concentration of products and reactants is the same, only that there is no change in time. So for example, if we wanna go back to one of our older reactions like this, when this reaction is at equilibrium, it does not mean that there's an equal number of glucose and oxygen and an equal number of CO2 and H2O. What it does mean is that the amount of glucose and O2 that's being converted into CO2 is the same as the amount of CO2 and H2O that's actually being converted back into glucose, right? Any chemical reaction is not just a one-way trip. It's always a back and forth. Usually when you have something like this, where it just shows an error in one direction, it just means that the vast, vast majority of the reactions happening are in this direction and only a tiny, tiny, tiny fraction are happening in the reverse direction. In equilibrium, it means there's an equal amount happening one way and the other way. Okay, so let's look at an example. Um, so for example, here, N2O4 turning into 2NO2, right? And it has the double arrows, which signifies it's at equilibrium. So the reaction is happening in both directions at all times, right? Even at the very start, when you just put in N2O4 into an empty container that has nothing in it, the N2O4 will be converted to 2NO2 at a very fast rate. But as soon as it's converted into 2NO2, some of that 2NO2 will start getting converted back into N2O4, right? Just at a much lower rate until you reach equilibrium, in which case um, they will happen at the same rate. So I can actually show you this graph right here. So this graph measures the concentration over time. So again, you start off just by introducing N N2O4 with nothing else in, the, in a container like a jar. There's zero concentration of NO2 at the start. And then rapidly it gets converted, right? As, and when it gets converted, it gets used up and more NO2 is made. And then um, it keeps going, keeps going, keeps going. So you reach this line. Okay. Um, please everybody, if you could mute your mics. Thank you. Um, so you reach this equilibrium point. And now you notice that the concentrations are over time, the Y over X is no longer changing for either of these. So what that, so what that means is that 
N204 is still being converted. So in this case, it's clear to see N204 is being converted into NO2. It's very easy to see because its concentration is going down and NO2's concentration is going up. But in this case, N204 is still being converted to, N to NO2, right? Even in this equilibrium region. But what's happening is that the same amount of 2NO2 is being converted back into N204, right? And because you're converting at the same rate, the overall amount actually doesn't change, right? There's still stuff happening. You just can't see it, right? It's like saying I walked 10 steps forward and then 10 steps backward. I essentially didn't move, but I was still walking, right? So you may not see that the displacement changed, but I was still moving. And even in this non-equilibrium section, right? Um, even in this non-equilibrium section, like I mentioned, it's very clear that N204 is being converted into NO2, right? We can see that by this trend. But at the same time, at all of these points, NO2 is being converted into N204 in the reverse direction. It's just happening much slower. And so the overall trend is that N204 is being converted to NO2, right? Even though the reaction is happening in both directions. So that would, like going back to my example, that would mean something like I walked 10 steps forward and then two steps backward. I'm still walking backwards a little bit, but overall I'm still moving forward up until this equilibrium region. And notice again, um, like I mentioned before, the concentration of each of these at equilibrium is not the same. There are very different concentrations um, it just so happens um, that one is higher than the other. Um, they could be equal, one could be higher, one could be lower, it doesn't matter. The concentrations don't have to be equal. Um, all that has to happen is that the concentration over time, the change over time is um, constant, it doesn't change. Okay, so um, there is this value called the equilibrium constant, right? Each equilibrium reaction has its own constant, which we write as KEQ, right? That determines whether the reaction favors the product or the reactants. Like I mentioned, um, once equilibrium is achieved, the concentration of products and reactants is not the same, at least usually it's not, or sometimes it's not, um, it, it could vary. Um, but when we say one reaction or one side is favored, what that means is once it reaches equilibrium, that side will have a higher concentration. So if we see here, NO2 has a higher concentration at equilibrium than N204. What that means is this reaction is favored, right, going this way, and the product and NO2 is favored over the reactant. And that's evidenced by there being more of it at equilibrium than N204. So if the reactant was favored, this reaction would be favored going backwards to the reactant. And the concentration of N204 at equilibrium in this region would be higher than it is for NO2, right? That would, that's what reactant favored would mean. But that's not the case here. Okay. Um, and that's determined by the equilibrium constant. So Equilibrium constants can range from being um, ridiculously small numbers like 10 to the negative 15th um, to ridiculously high numbers like 10 to the 15th, or even higher or lower than those two. Um, the larger the equilibrium constant is, the more it favors the reaction to the right or the product. The smaller the uh, equilibrium constant is, the more it favors the reaction to the left. So for example, if we had an equilibrium constant like 10 to the 15th, Right, that's a really, really big number, meaning that it favors the product very, very heavily. And at equilibrium, there will be much, much, much more product than there is reactant. Right? You'll reach equilibrium, but at equilibrium, there will be much, much more product than there is uh, reactant. Um, on the other hand, a very small number, like 10 to the negative 15, uh, would mean that at equilibrium, there is much higher amounts of reactant than there is product and this um, reaction is favored to the left, right? Back towards the reactant side. Um, 
Um, and the actual equation for this reflects that. The equation for KEQ is um, KF over KR, which you don't really have to know. We'll um, talk about those later. Those are the um, uh, rates of the actual reaction, but um, it can also be equal to the concentrations, right? Concentration of NO2 over the concentration of N2O4 at equilibrium, right? KQ equals concentration of product over reactant at equilibrium. And notice how this, the product is squared. That is because it has a coefficient of two. So if an, any element has a coefficient, that coefficient um, will become its exponent, right? So if, for example, we had three N2O4 going into um, six NO2, this would be six to the sixth power and this would be to the third power, for example, right? Okay. Before I move on to the first poll question of the day, um, does anybody have any questions about anything I covered so far? About equilibrium constant or equilibrium in general or um, anything so far? Um, so, okay, um, somebody asked about um, QRX. Um, do you mean um, like the Q in, for example, um, th this equation, G equals N R T L N Q. Are you talking about this Q? Uh, no, there's sometimes I don't see something when um, QRX is greater than KEQ. Does it favor products or reactants? So I don't know what QRX is. You know how it um So I, I would need something more specific than Q because a lot of things in chemistry and physics use Q. Um, the only thing I can think of that's kind of related to this is um, that Q that I just mentioned, the GT equals R and LN Q. Um, that Q is uh, the same as... Um, KEQ, um, the only difference is, and we use that in thermodynamics, which we covered earlier. Uh, the only time we use that is when um, things are not at equilibrium, mm -hmm. right? Okay. And um, somebody else asked, what is the point of K? And Chris um, kind of answered in the chat. Um, the equilibrium constant is the ratio of products to reactants when the reaction reaches equilibrium. Basically, um, the equilibrium constant, um, what it does for us mainly, is it tells us which side it favors. So if a reaction, so a reaction, a reaction. We, sorry, um, can everybody mute? I think I'm going to help somebody. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, so if a react, we can just by looking at the KEQ, the re, um, reaction uh, equilibrium constant, uh, we can see at equilibrium, will there be more products or more reactants? We can see what the ratio is. We can see what the, um, kind of which side is more favored, whether this reaction is efficient or not efficient. And this could be used, and this is very commonly used in, um, in industry, right? For chemistry, you wanna have a reaction that has the highest possible KEQ because obviously you wanna make some kind of product, right? You wanna take some reactants and you wanna convert as much reactant as possible to as much product as possible. So you want something that has a really high KEQ um, a process has really high KEQ, um, so you're just getting more product, right, per reactant. And just basically tells us the ratio of product over react, of product to reactant once it reaches equilibrium. Yeah. Any other questions? And uh, yeah, Chris kind of mentioned that as well. Okay. Um, so based on what I just mentioned, um, let's see if you guys can answer this question. I'm going to open the poll. Please take about um, a minute or two um, just to answer this, okay? And if you have any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat. Okay. 
Okay, let's take another um, maybe 30 seconds. It's a minute to answer this question. Okay, so I'm going to end the poll in a couple of seconds. Get your answers in if you haven't already. Okay. So um, the majority of people voted for A, with um, C being, um, with C and B also being other answer choices people have picked. So the correct answer actually is C. Um, and let's um, go over why, right? So like I mentioned, um, KEQ equals, um, sorry, this is Q, equals concentration of uh, products, which P over concentration of reactants, right? And we know that for reaction one, or reaction, yeah, reaction one, um, the concentration of, um, I'm gonna ignore the coefficients for now. I'll like pretend I'm using the coefficients, um, but yeah, it's just annoying to write. And it's a little bit hard on this, but uh, it would be C over D is equal to A times B, right? And they would have the proper um, exponents. So um, A would have three, B would have two, uh, C would have three, D would have four, right? And you know that this C times D over A times B is equal to 0 0.1 or one over 10. I think that might make it easier to see. So you know that C times D over A times B is one over 10. They told you that. Um, now we wanna see what it is for reaction two. Well, we know KEQ of reaction two is equal to, again, products over reactants, except this time the products are A and B, and the, react and the um, reactants are D, C, again, all with the proper exponents um, corresponding to the coefficients. Um, I'm just not writing that out right now, but yeah. Um, so KQ is this, right? So we know what C times D over A times B is, it's one over 10. So if you just did A times B over D times C, what would that be? Well, you, you know, of this, you can say C times D is equal to one and A times B is equal to 10, which we know because C times D over A to B is one to 10. Well, we know that A times B over C times D is 10 over one, right? It's the inverse, 10 over one or 10, which gives you the answer of C, right? Does that make sense to everybody? Is, that, is it clear why it's not A, right? Even though it is the same, um, it is the same react, uh, reaction in a sense, it's inverted, right? The, what was the products have now become the reactants. What were the reactants have now become the products. And um, essentially um, how mm -hmm. you can do this, uh, what you can do with this is, so in this case, they gave you um, both of these reactions, right? But technically, if you look at it, um, this is the forward reaction. So I'm gonna cross this out. This is this reaction. Whereas this is like this, whereas this reaction two is this same reaction as reaction one, except it's now this reaction, the backwards, right? This is reaction two now. It's the same thing, right? So you know that if the KQ for um, the full, uh, for one reaction is um, one thing, if you then um, kind of flip it, it's the, it's like the opposite thing. If you want to think of it that way, right? If you flip it, it's the opposite for any equilibrium constant. 
Um, if, that make, uh, if anybody has any questions, please feel free to ask. Um, otherwise, I'm gonna move on in about a second. Um, still talking about equilibrium, just a different topic in equilibrium. But if you have any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat and um, Chris will get to them. He will explain everything to you. Um, okay, um, next one's about Le, Chat Le Chatelier's principle, right? Um, Le Chatelier's principle states that equilibriums shift in response to external conditions. So for example, if more molecules are put in, the equilibrium will shift in opposite directions to bounce out. Like I mentioned, an equilibrium is kind of like um, a balancing, uh, uh, an equation or reaction that is completely balanced. If you put something in, it'll disrupt the balance completely. If you disrupt the balance, nature will try and find a way to kind of work around it and rebalance it a different way, right? Um, one way that you can disrupt the balance is if you put more of something in, right? Um, for example, uh, like I mentioned earlier, right? This is based, this is like a graph like this, but if you put in more NO2 or more, uh, okay, if you put in more of the product or more of the reactant, the equilibrium will shift to try and compensate that, right? Because of course, if you put in more of something, so for example, going back to this graph, if I put in, if I suddenly put in more NO2, so now the graph looks like this, it's no longer balanced because the NO2 has, the balance in NO2 has been disrupted. It needs to kind of find a way to rebalance itself, right? And because this graph would be messed up, equilibrium will be destroyed, it needs to find a way to rebalance itself. The way it does that is by shifting the equilibrium constant and um, the direction the equilibrium goes, right? Oh, sorry, went actually far. All right. Um, so, um, like I mentioned, you have NO2, um, and what was it to, um, N2O4, right? If you're going this way, uh, this is an equilibrium. If you add in more N2O4, you'll have more reactant. Um, that'll break the equilibrium. It'll shift it to compensate the, um, the reaction will automatically um, take some of the N2O4 you added and it'll turn it into NO2, right? It'll, and that will actually like break the um, equilibrium, right? At equilibrium, the concentration levels over time don't change, where if you add in more N2O4, it will change, you'll have more NO2, right? More NO2 being produced, right? It'll speed up, essentially, if you want to think that way. Yeah, exactly. The increase in concentration um, will increase the rate, right? So, okay. And if you want to think of it mathematically, and I can actually um, show you exactly this mathematically, right? So, KQ doesn't change, by the way. KEQ always stays the same for the same reaction, right? Doesn't matter how much N2O4 there is, doesn't matter how much N2NO2 there is. KEQ is the same for this reaction. Well, what happened is, so if, say you had a number. Uh, I'm just going to use numbers just because it might be easier to explain. Say the concentration of N, NO2 is 5. Concentration of N2O4 is at equilibrium is, say, um, I don't know, 10. So maybe actually it should be lower, but just pretend we're doing this, right? It doesn't really matter um, which equation we use. Um, that means KEQ will be 25 over 10 or approx or essentially 2.5, right? That's what KEQ is. KEQ for this reaction will always be 2.5, right? Well, what would happen if we took this five, suddenly we added in a bunch more NO2 into the reaction. We added in so much that the concentration shifted from 10 uh, from five to 15. Well, now 15 squared over 10 is no longer 2.5. Essentially what, what that would mean was be, would be that KEQ would shift, but we know that KEQ doesn't change, right? If you add in more. So we have to find a way to make sure that KEQ doesn't change, right? It's, and we have to accommodate this 15 somehow. 
what this uh, what the reaction would naturally do is it would take some of that 15, turn it into maybe 10, right? So take some of that away and turn it into some of this product and some of this reactant, I should say, right? It will shift the equilibrium so that more um, reactant is being produced, right? And it may shift it to, I'm not actually sure um, how to make two, point, it'll be 100 on the top. Then to get 2.5, you would need 40, right? So take some of that and then convert it into um, 40 right here, right? That would give you 100 over 40, which is still 2.5, right? And the KQ would remain unchanged. So it would take, um, so take, so you put enough to make it 15, it would then realize, well, this doesn't work anymore. Take some away from that 15, give it to the other side to make the denominator bigger and itself smaller to the point where KQ is again 2.5. That's just an example, right? Does that make sense? Okay. I guess was the old question. Okay. Um, another thing I wanted to point out is that um, con uh, equilibrium can be uh, written in concentration or it can be written as partial pressure for gases, right? So Le Chatelier's principle can apply to changing pressure as well as concentration. I'll give you an example. Here, we did KEQ is equal to concentration of NO2 to N2O4. KEQ also equals partial pressure of NO2. Assuming these are all gases, which in this case they are, squared over partial pressure of N2O4. And, and I mentioned partial pressure in a recent lecture on fluids, right? So um, if we're talking about gases, we can still find the KEQ using partial pressure, right? Doesn't just have to be concentration. It can also be mole fractions, but that's, um, I don't really want to get into that because it's, you'll never really see it. But um, partial pressures you might see with gases. Um, and that's not, that's equally valid way to find KQ. If you find it this way or that way, you should get um, the same thing, right? It should translate the same, right? And you can use partial pressures of gases. What that also means is that just like if you change the concentration um, in an equilibrium, it would cause a shift in the opposite direction. If you change the pressure, one of the gases, it would cause a shift in the other direction as well, right? If you change the, say, the partial pressure of NO2, it would cause a shift. Generally, the, the best way to um, create a, a shift in partial pressure is actually by changing the concentration of the gas. Um, but there, that's not the only way. You can also change it through um, temperature and um, total pressure as well. So you can change it by total pressure as well. Right, and yeah, um, Chris mentioned in the chat, you can change it through temperature or through partial pressure. And there are different ways that this happens, right? Right, um, I think that there, uh, I don't, I can't really cover everything, every single thing in detail because like people spend entire semesters, college learning about um, kinetics, equilibrium, thermodynamics, all that stuff. Can't really spend that much time on it, but I'm trying to give you guys the foundation of the Chatelier's principle and the general equation for equilibrium constant so that you can then learn any other specific tiny things that you can, that you would need on your own. So for example, how does temperature affect? Well, or how does pressure affect? Well, knowing that the Chatelier's principle applies to pressure or temperature or anything like that, you can then figure that out, right? Just by manipulating the equation, right? And, that, and I would highly recommend, um, trying to get used to that, right? Using information that you already know, because the MCAT will very uh, often ask you to do that. Take information that you already know and then apply it to something that you're not very familiar with, but that is um, e easily acquired from knowledge that you know, right? 
yeah, uh, KEQ is, um, KEQ, um, I didn't say it, 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 it does change on temp, it, it changes, it's the same for any one reaction at any one temperature. That, that, that's what I should have said, sorry. I apologize about that, yeah. It's the, it's the um, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so next poll question, I'll relaunch the polling. Okay, so please um, take some time. So take another 30 seconds. Okay, closing the poll. So the majority of people picked um, answer choice A, which I'm happy to say is correct. Right, so the majority of you did seem to get it. Um, I'm gonna go over why, right? So again, I mentioned um, that with gases, one of the things that can affect um, equilibrium is um, the pressure, right? Well, so what we're trying to do is we're trying to change the pressure. First step is I think we should um, write out the equation, right? Um, so KQ, and that's how we would know you increase the um, formation of product is by increasing KQ, right? I mentioned that earlier. So KQ equals the partial pressure of the product, which is FeI3 over um, partial pressure of FeI times the partial pressure of I2. Well, you know that the partial pressure of anything that's not a gas is really kind of irrelevant, right? This and this, like aqueous solutions like these two, they don't, um, they aren't really impacted by part, they don't really contribute to the partial pressure. Essentially all of the partial pressure in the solution is all I2. The aqueous solutions contribute so, so little to partial pressure that it's essentially non-existent. So increasing pressure would be essentially the same as adding in um, as adding in more I2, right? It, it would have the same effect as if you just straight up added more concentration of um, I2, right? Um, so decreasing the pressure, obviously not. We need to increase the pressure, right? Because by increasing the, the total pressure, if you remember from my uh, lecture on fluids, where I talk about gases, increasing the pressure would obviously increase the partial pressure of uh, I, uh, I2, 
right? You increase the pressure of uh, the partial pressure of I2, it's the same as increasing the um, concentration of I2, and it would shift the equilibrium to the right, right, by making more uh, product be formed. So it's not B. Decreasing the volume while maintaining constant pressure. Well, if it's constant pressure, it's not doing anything. It doesn't matter about volume, right? But we know that in a container, in a set container, volume, pressure are inversely proportional. If you increase the volume um, without uh, doing something that, uh, like for example, in D where you maintain constant pressure without doing some kind of extra work um, to keep the pressure constant, increasing the volume will decrease the pressure, right? Whereas decreasing the volume will increase the pressure. Therefore, we want to increase the pressure by decreasing the volume. Does that make sense? So, and um, just to reiterate, the reason that um, increasing the pressure won't have any effect on FeI3 or FeI is actually because um, Partial pressure is only really for gases. Technically, liquids, solids, aqueous solutions do have a partial pressure, but it's like comparing um, one to a billion. If you add one to a billion, it's essentially just a billion because it, it's like a rounding error, right? It, it doesn't actually change. It doesn't really change the number, right? So essentially, liquids, gas, uh, liquid, solids, and aqueous solutions don't contribute to partial pressure. Only um, I two or only gases do. So increasing the pressure would have no effect on this, no effect on this. All it would do would increase this, right? If you had something like say O2 or um, 202 here on the right, for example, if I was to add something to this equation, right? And pretend like this is balanced. I know it's not, but pretend. Um, now you have uh, two moles of gases in the products and one mole of gases in the reactants. Now, when you would increase part pressure as a whole, you would have the partial pressure of O2 would increase, PO2 would double, and I, uh, PI2 would double as well, right? But because this has a two in front of it, right? 202, it would actually be squared, so it would be doubled squared, which is quadrupled compared to I2, which is only doubled, right? So that would essentially um, make, give higher partial pressure or partial pr pressure equivalence to O2, making the equilibrium shift to the left, but that's in a different problem. Um, so what it, so somebody asked, what if instead of pressures, they had moles, a uh, number of moles of these gases, is it still a proportional uh, relationship? Um, I'm not sure exactly what you mean. So for example, if they said, um, we're increasing uh, the moles while keeping the volume the same, right? That's actually just increasing concentration. So you know what happens when you increase concentration in an equilibrium, the Chatelier's principle also applies if you, um, uh, other than that, I'm not exactly sure if you could clarify your question. I think you just answered it, mm -hmm. Mark. You just said um, number of moles is same as increase in concentration, so. Not always, not always, because um, if, you, if you remember concentration is moles per liter, if you increase uh, volume, which is liter, by the same mm -hmm. amount that you increase moles, it's uh, mm -hmm. it doesn't actually do anything. But if you just increase moles, but while keeping everything else the same, then yes, okay. it is you're increasing concentration. But they, I doubt they would ever say that because that that's just unnecessarily tricky. They would say mm -hmm. we're increasing the concentration. Okay, I can deal with that. Yeah. Okay. Um, moving on, so we're almost done with um, equilibrium, but. Um, it's gone. So in equilibrium, there are two reactions with two different K values, but the rates, um, again, should be at equilibrium. Um, this is actually going into um, rates. So I believe, okay, um, this slide is actually out of order. So that was my mistake. I'll fix it when I post it. Um, I'll come back to this slide, right? I'll come back to this when I um, 
finish kinetics. Okay, next we're moving on to um, kinetics or reaction rates um, is kind of a better word for it. Um, reaction rates. Um, when we do a reaction, we talk about in thermodynamics, we covered it. Thermodynamics tells you if a reaction will or will not occur in nature. It does not tell you how fast it will occur or how long it will take for it to occur. For example, there could be a reaction that has an extremely negative delta G, which if you remember from thermodynamics means it's extremely favorable and will happen spontaneously, which means it will naturally happen with no outside help. However, I said a process with a negative delta G that is extremely negative may happen, but you will never see it happen because it will take hundreds of years for it to fully occur, right? For the reaction to fully happen. Um, it will occur, just it will take very long. That's a very extreme example, but it's just um, something I wanted to note. What determines how fast something will happen is, has nothing to do with, or very little to do with thermodynamics and um, a lot to do with kinetics, right? The kinetics of a reaction or the rate of a reaction. So um, the way we determine rate of a reaction is mainly through this equation right here that's on screen. Rate equals a rate constant, which is, I know this is a little bit confusing, it's also K, but it's different from KQ. That's uppercase K, this is lowercase K. Um, I will tell you how they actually do play together later on, and you actually might have already seen it in one of the previous slides, but, um, but yeah, this is lowercase k, which is fairly different from that k in that um, rate constant is, um, firstly, rate constant, I believe, um, so rate constant does have units. Won't get into one, what those units are because those units are not actually the same every time. Depending on the reaction, the units actually of k, of rate constant k actually change, right? So it actually doesn't have one set of units as very, has different units. Whereas KEQ is unitless, it doesn't have units. That's why you can do something like partial pressure over partial pressure or concentration over concentration because it doesn't have units, right? So it doesn't matter if you're using pressures, concentration, doesn't matter what, you're using mole fractions, whatever. It, it, it's unitless. So as long as you have the same units on top as you do on the bottom, it's all good. Okay, um, but um, do we have this little K? Then we have um, concentration of A, which is um, some reactant. Then we have concentration of B, which is some other reactant. And then you could have a C, D, E, F, whatever, how many reactant, reactants you have, right? And these are just concentrations like you've seen in hard brackets always means concentrations. Um, the tricky part is this lowercase a, this lowercase b, these, these exponents. Like I mentioned in equilibrium, exponents reflected coefficients. In reaction order and reaction rate, they do not reflect coefficients. For example, something like, um, like our example that we've talked about all day, N204 to 2NO2. When you're looking at um, with respect the rate with respect to N NO2, A, low, lowercase a, the exponent would not have to be two. It could be two, but it doesn't have to be two, right? It could be one, it could be zero, it could be two, it could be three, right? We don't know. The only way to really know is if they either tell us or in how scientists actually find out is through experimental means. So the orders have no correlation to stoichiometric uh, coefficients. The order redirecting can only be given to since you're not doing experiments. Obviously, you can't be, uh, find it experimentally. Each reactant can be zeroth order, first order, or second order. Um, there is also a third order. They, this won't really come up in the MCAT, um, at least for a single coefficient, right? For example, A, if A, has a, um, an exponent of one, it's to the first order because it has an exponent of one. If B has an exponent of two, it is to the second order, but B is to the second order and A is to the first order. The rate, the order of the reaction with respect to A is to the first order, 
the order of the reaction with respect to B is the second order. The order of the reaction overall is the sum of all of the orders of each reactant. So if you were finding um, the order of the reaction as a whole, it would be one plus two because it's with respect to A and with respect to B. So it's one plus two, it would be a third order reaction overall. But with respect to A, it's a first order. With respect to B, it's a second order. Okay. Okay. So another quick poll question. Um, not going to give you guys very long, maybe just a minute for this one, because um, I want to kind of speed through a little bit. We still have a bit to go, right? Okay, like I said, uh, like I said, I'm not um, taking too long. So please um, get your interested in the next like 15, 20 seconds. Okay. All right, manning the poll. So the most popular answer, um, uh, by a majority was C. However, the answer is actually D. And this is kind of what I expected um, because this is a trick question actually, right? But it's a trick question they may ask you on the MCAT, right? This is a, a very, this is very similar to an MCAT question. They may, they do sometimes actually like to give you trick questions on MCAT. So um, don't think this is above them, right? So, the reason that you can't determine this is because it mentions second order reaction, right? Concentration of a reactant in a second order reaction is increased by a factor of four. What I'm assuming, and the reason why many of you picked um, C, is because you assumed, well, if the concentration was X uh, squared, um, multiplying it by four, uh, turning it to four X would mean 16 X squared, right? And that would be true, right? That would be exactly true. If it mentioned that the reaction was second order with respect to the reactant, right? If it said that A had um, order of two in this reaction, what it actually said was that the sum of all of the reactants, so A, B, C, whatever, the sum of all of these is two. We don't know if A is two and B is zero and C is zero. We don't know if A is um, instead one, B is one, C is zero. We don't know if A is zero and B is um, two or something like that. We don't know, right? Because they didn't mention what the order was with respect to the reactant that we're looking at specifically. Um, if it was, for, for example, if it was to the first order, with respect to the reactant we're looking at, and there was another reactant that was first order, we would have a second order overall reaction. So the statement would still be true in the question, but by increasing by a factor of four, it's not C, it would be B, right? It would increase by a factor of four because it would only have an exponent of one. If instead it was a zeroth order with respect to the reactant we're looking at and second order to some other reactant, increasing the by a factor of four would, May give A as a correct answer and not B or C because anything to the zeroth power is one. Doesn't matter if it's one, 10, 50, 100, right? Increasing it would have no effect. That's why we don't know. It could be A, it could be B, it could be C. We can't determine it. Does that make sense? <laughs> 
Um, no, concentration does affect. So like I mentioned, um, actually here. So concentration is um, this. It, it, so rate is based on the concentration, right? In, in the hard brackets, it means concentration. So if you increase, well, and like I said, if um, A actually was two, right? Then increasing um, the concentration of reactant A by a factor of four would increase the rate by a factor of 16, right? Because like I mentioned, four, um, if you add X uh, to the squared, it would be X squared. If you had four X, if you multiply X by four, you had four X, then you squared it, you'd actually have 16 X squared, right? It would increase by a factor of 16. Um, so that would increase the rate by a factor of 16. If this was maybe um, one, then increasing by a factor of four would increase by the rate by a factor of four, right? It would, it would be by the same exponent. If this was zero, it wouldn't change it at all, right? So it would change, right? Yeah, you, um, no problem. Just, um, it, was, it was a good task, please. Um, if anybody has a question, I don't want you guys to be confused. That's the main thing. Um, so like I mentioned, the reason this answer was, this question was hard is because it was actually a trick question. Um, and they really want you to pay attention to the wording, right? Okay. Um, any other questions before I move on? If you're confused so far, please like ask questions right now because um, if you're confused now, it, it'll, it'll only compound and get a little more confusing as we go on because we're gonna be using some of that information in this next part. And if you, you guys get confused at any point, please feel free to ask in the chat. Um, Chris will help you out. Okay, next we're gonna talk about rate determining step. Um, rate determining step is what happens when there's a reaction that has multiple steps, right? So we may write A plus B plus C equals ABC, right? This may be how we write a reaction overall. However, most reactions don't happen in one step, especially complex ones. Like the one I showed you earlier of the um, glucose plus O2 going into um, uh, CO2 plus H2O. It looked so simple because it looked like it was in one step, like it just happens, right? That actually takes like a many, many, many steps and you'll actually learn about those steps when we cover biology, right? And biochemistry. Um, so something like that looks simple, like A plus B plus C goes into ABC is not actually how like that, right? When you expand it, it's actually multiple different steps. So for example, like this, A plus B goes into AB and then AB plus C equals ABC. What does this have to do with kinetics? Well, each of these steps doesn't happen at the same speed. And if you see some of these steps may be slow, some of these steps may be fast. And when they say something is slow and fast, what they mean is there's a big difference. It's not like um, slow takes five minutes and fast takes three minutes. It's more like um, slow could take hours, whereas fast could take milliseconds, right? Something like very extreme differences. Um, when we determine the rate of any reaction overall, so for example, if we were determining the reaction of this whole two-step process, A plus B plus C equals ABC, we would basically be ignoring any fast steps like this. We'll be ignoring this and we would just be focusing on finding the rate of this slow step, right? Why that is, is because the slow step is essentially 99.9% .9 of the, the whole rate, right? I kind of want to, I kind of like, um, and I've said this before, it's kind of like if you're cooking, for example, if you're cooking, like uh, if you're like slow roasting, some kind of meat or something, and it takes eight hours to cook. And bef but before you start cooking for eight hours, you have to uh, chop up some vegetables and it takes two minutes to chop up vegetables. When somebody asks you, how long does it take to cook this meat, right? You would say eight hours. You wouldn't say eight hours and two minutes, right? Because eight hours is such a big time compared to two minutes that it's actually not worth mentioning the two minutes, right? It, it's, it doesn't make a difference, right? It, it's essentially, it could be essentially just a rounding error. 
And same thing applies here. The slow step is so much slower than the fast step. Then when we're talking about the reaction, the whole thing overall, we don't really care about how long the fast step takes because it basically took no time compared to the slow step. And that's why we call the slow step the rate determining step because its rate determines the rate of the whole reaction is the rate determining step. Um, so therefore the rate of multi-step reaction, we always set it equal to the rate of the slowest step. In this case, step one is the slowest step. And so the rate of the whole reaction would be rate equals K1 times uh, A to the power of X times B to the power of X, right? Which if you look at it is just um, the rate law um, that we talked about earlier applied to this thing, right? If you looked at, um, if you applied the rate law to um, the overall reaction, it would be different. It would have um, C in there as well, but um, we can't do that because that's not a step, right? It's a, it's a process. This blue part is a process, it's not a step. We can't do that. Um, and we could apply the rate law to this step, but like I mentioned, the rate is so small, it doesn't matter. Um, if instead the second step was a slow one, um, the equation would instead be, um, I actually um, did this incorrectly, I actually say K2, A, B. Um, now, again, I'll fix that when um, posting. Um, the rate would be K2, uh, concentration of AB to the X, like that, okay? So let's talk about intermediates, right? And um, this is actually um, similar to the, um, the reaction we've been looking at all day, right? If step two is the slow step, the equation would have the rate law of, again, I made this mistake, um, here as well, it should be K2, not K negative one. So it would be rate equals K2, concentration of N2O2 plus o, uh, concent times concentration of O2. However, we don't know the concentration of N2O2 because concentration of N2O2 is, an, is um, intermediate, right? This, anything, uh, an intermediate is anything that doesn't appear at the beginning of the reaction or um, at the end of the reaction. So for example, if you look at the reaction overall, N2O2 doesn't appear at the start or at the finish. It only appears in the middle, right? It's just something that appears in the middle and then just disappears before the end, right? Intermediates, we don't include in rate laws ever, right? Because they're just too hard to measure and too hard to use essentially effectively. But the rate law calls for us to use the concentration of N2O2. Well, the way we do that is we actually have to do just a bit of math, right, to solve it. We know that the concentration, that K1 times the concentration of NO squared is equal to K negative one um, concentration of N2O2, right? Since, it, since it's in equilibrium, right? And um, that's because we talked about an equilibrium, the rate of the forward reaction, and the rate of the reverse reaction are equal in an equilibrium. This is an equilibrium. And what fast equilibrium means is that as soon as you put in the NO into the beaker, it'll start up and it'll very, very rapidly just go into an equilibrium, right? It'll set up an equilibrium very fast. It doesn't take very long um, to get into an equilibrium. Um, so that means the rate of the forward and reverse reactions are equal. Um, we can apply the rate laws to, and set them equal to each other. We can then um, solve for um, concentration of N2O2 um, using this rate law, right? Because we can just isolate it. We can just isolate it like this and set it equal to these all of these values, which we will know, right? We know what the initial concentration of NO, um, NO is because uh, we're putting it in, so we hopefully know it. We know what the value of K1 is. We would have done that experiment before. We also know what K negative one is. Again, we would have done that experiment before and we could easily figure it out. Um, so now we can take this overall rate law that we started with, which we couldn't use initially because it had an intermediate in it, this N2O2. We can't use intermediates, but now that we solved for what an intermediate, for what our intermediate equals, we can now substitute this whole thing into this equation and actually get rid of the N2O2, right? And we can actually get 
this is our rate law, right? Hopefully that makes sense. So we just wrote the rate law of this step because it's the slow step, just how we would normally write it. And then we just simply, um, because we couldn't use the concentration of intermediate, we then had to just solve for the concentration of intermediate, which we could do here, right? Using this equation. And then once we isolated what it was equal to, we could just substitute in, which is um, something you very commonly likely have done in physics, math, any type of um, math-based um, science. Um, K negative one is not saying that it's um, the negative of K one. What it's saying is it's the reverse of K one. It's the reverse reaction of, of um, the first reaction. So uh, K one is the uh, rate of reaction one. K negative one is the rate of the uh, inverse of reaction one, right? So this, it's the reverse reaction of um, reverse reaction one, essentially. It's the backward step. If you want to think of it that way, it's the rate of the backward step. Okay, any other questions about this? Because this may be a little bit confusing. So anybody, any questions on it? Okay. Going to move on. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask. Um, Next, we want to talk about active. Um, actually, I believe now. Um, actually, no. We'll save this until the end. Okay. Next, we want to talk about activation energy and um, activation energy and um, curves, right? So, first, I want to just annotate this. So, like it says here. The x-axis represents the reaction progress from start to finish. The y-axis represents Gibbs free energy, which is delta G, if you guys remember from the thermodynamics lecture we did, right, delta G, right? Um, a system always wants to have as low Gibbs free energy as possible. Um, likely, um, most of this, at least up until like uh, this point, all of this is actually like a negative value. So like zero would probably be somewhere here, maybe even higher, right? Everything might be negative, right? And um, the more negative uh, delta G value is, um, the more favorable it is, right? So we wanna have a more negative um, G value. Um, and even in a positive G value, we really, really don't wanna have a high positive delta G value. We wanna have as low a, a G value as possible. So um, system always wants to have as low Gibbs free energy as possible. And so we'll move towards a state that has less energy spontaneously or with outside, without outside interference, like we mentioned in our thermodynamics lecture. Right? And you've probably seen this kind of curve, right? Um, starts off at a certain energy value, goes through bumps, bumps, and then it ends at a lower energy value. It goes from high energy to low energy. But in order to go from high energy to low energy, it needs to overcome this bump. And then again, this bump, right? And that happens as a reaction proceeds, right? And a reaction won't really start unless it overcomes this bump, right? And you can see that it takes a lot of energy to overcome that bump, right? It's a huge um, rise in energy costs, right? It's very, difficult for something to do on its own. It has to be essentially jump-started. If you want to think of like a car, it needs to be jump-started in order for the reaction to proceed. This is called, um, this value that is required to jump-start it is essentially called the activation energy or EA. And it's right here. And it's the value from this starting energy to the top of this hill, right? And this is the hill it needs to overcome. And again, this is a multi-step. Um, this is the curve for a multi-step reaction, right? This is reaction one, and this would be reaction two, and this would be the product. Um, so this would be the intermediate step, right? And then from the intermediate, the, notice the intermediates are a little bit higher energy than the reactants, um, but gets the intermediates, and then it's a little bit of another hill, another activation energy, and then you go to very low energy products. Okay. 
Um, but like I mentioned, it could take months, years for a reaction that on paper has a negative delta G value, right? Look, it, it starts at high energy and then it goes, ends in low energy, right? So this would very easily happen. Well, no, it won't because sometimes this mountain is really high and it's very, very difficult. It takes months and months and years for it to randomly um, get a, a spark, if you want to think of it that way, to jumpstart itself. However, there are these things called catalysts. A catalyst is a compound that appears at the beginning of a reaction and at the end of a reaction completely unchanged. Um, this is kind of the opposite of an intermediate, which appears only in the middle, doesn't appear at the start or the end. Catalysts appear at the start and the end unchanged. Um, they also appear in the middle. However, they may be changed in the middle, right? And most actually are, um, that's how they work, right? They have some kind of favorable interaction with one of the reactants or more commonly with actually the intermediate, right? Because if you noticed the intermediate, so reaction one is actually kind of hard to do because it starts off as a low energy and ends up in a higher energy position than it started with, which is not very favorable. Um, a cat, what a catalyst can do is kind of um, alleviate this by having special interactions with the um, intermediate. Um, but the way this looks like on the graph is actually, um, and I'll show you in a second, actually looks like this, where it lowers the activation energy. Um, it fulfills a very important function by um, increasing the rate of reaction. Um, so if a reaction is thermodynamically favorable, but may take hours or days to happen on its own naturally, um, with a catalyst, it can speed it up so it takes seconds to happen, right? It can have a massive, massive influence depending on how good of a catalyst it is. And it allows reactions to occur much quicker. Um, the way that it does it, like I mentioned, is by lowering activation energy required, right? So if you wanna look at it here, this is the reactants products you notice uh, from high energy to low energy. But without a catalyst, it has a very high hill that it has to overcome, right? It needs a big spark to get it started, jump start. But if you add in a catalyst into the reaction, it greatly lowers the activation energy required. And now there's a much easier hill to overcome and it's much faster to overcome it. Notice how a catalyst doesn't change the starting energy. It's still the same, no matter whether you use a catalyst or not. Starting energy is the same. The final energy is the same. The, the amount of energy at the beginning or the end doesn't change only thing that changes is the um, activation energy. That's the only thing a catalyst can do. Um, okay. Um, reminder that all enzymes are catalysts. Um, an enzyme just means that it's a catalyst that happened that shows up in our body. It's a biological catalyst. So all enzymes do this, right? All enzymes have this as their primary function which is to speed up biological reactions. If it wasn't for enzymes, biological reactions, all the reactions in our body would have this kind of energy and they would take much, much, much longer for them to occur. And uh, we would probably die because we would have no energy and it would take uh, way too long to make energy and we couldn't survive, right? So enzymes are very important. Catalysts are very important in the industrial chemistry. Um, so last clicker question of the day. Um, I believe we only have a couple more slides after this. So we're almost done. So please just take um, a minute or so. This question should be fairly straightforward, I think. <clears throat> 
So take another 10, 15 seconds. Okay. So now the plan. All right. Um, so actually everyone uh, picked choice B, which um, I'm happy about. And I guess I uh, kind of nailed the point, the whole, um, nailed home the point enough. Uh, Catalyst increased the rate of reaction by lowering activation energy. Again, A is not correct because they are not used up. They have to be present at the end of the reaction completely unchanged in order to be considered a catalyst. Otherwise, it's just another reactant. Catalysts alter thermodynamics. No, they don't. They don't change the delta G at all. All they affect is the kinetics. Okay. Uh, catalyze, stabilize the transition state by bringing it to a higher energy. Again, doesn't change the energy. Just changes the activation energy rather than the, the energy of the transition state or the... Um, products or reactants, and also bringing it to a higher energy would actually make it more unfavorable. Um, okay, so that was the last lecture, but there was another slide that I wanted to cover, right? We talked about little k and big k, right? Well, um, there was this slide, which I'm not sure if any of you guys noticed, but keq equals kf over kr. And notice how this is lowercase k, and f is means, in this case, forward, r means reverse, right? I wrote it as k1 and k negative 1, and oftentimes you'll see k1, k negative 1. This one uses kf, kr, doesn't matter, same, means the same thing. Um, the equilibrium constant is also proportional to the rate laws, right? So the higher the rate laws, the higher the equilibrium constant. What that means is, for example, if the forward reaction happens very fast, that means, um, and compared to the reverse reaction, if the forward reaction happens very fast compared to the reverse reaction, at the end, when it does eventually reach equilibrium, um, the KEQ will favor the right side and more of the product will be uh, created, right? It'll favor the forward reaction. Very simple, but I just wanted to show that these two K values are related. And there's this slide. Um, again, in equilibrium, there are two reactions with two different K values, but the rates should be equal at equilibrium. Again, forward reaction, reverse reaction, K1, K negative one. Um, the equations are also different. The forward reaction has this, while the reverse reaction has this. Um, but again, you could set them equal to each other and essentially say, K1 N204 equals K negative one NO2. Okay. All right. So that's it for today. Um, I'll stick around for another couple of minutes if anybody has any questions. I know I skipped um, over the last part a little bit quickly, but please, if you have any questions, feel free. Um, I'll also be making um, a couple of edits that I wanted to this um, lecture just tidy up a little bit and then I'll post it in the next 10 minutes, 15 minutes. But if you have any questions, please, in the chat. Mark, is the... Uh, could you mute your other... Yeah, Go ahead. is this better? Yeah. I think so. Oh, yes. Is the... You, you showed the graph with the intermediate. You said it's always at a higher energy than the products. Um, not... Well, it, oh, no, the, the intermediate is, is at a higher energy than the products, yes. Than the products, yes. Than the reactants, you said. Oh, in, in the reactants? Um, look mostly, at the graph. Yeah, 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 yes. yeah, I know, I, I know that. Um, in, in this case, yeah. Um, in this case, it's definitely. So, so most I cases, a, I believe mm -hmm. it'll also, most cases it will be, um, mm -hmm. but I don't know with every case. I, I'm not sure. It may be, but I wouldn't, I don't feel comfortable making that rule. But usually it is. I know that usually it, it is, um, intermediate are is higher energy than the um so if you had a go ahead go ahead oh, oh um, go on. i'm gonna let you finish go ahead okay and i say it's always the intermediate is always higher energy than the products otherwise it's not a spontaneous reaction mm -hmm. so now would they give a i had a graph where it had mm -hmm. uh it's a quick share they had all three on the same graph and they wanted to us to determine which one was the intermediate product and i think you do you want to take a look at it real quick it was just um Sure. Well, the product would always be right here. The in, no, the they literally reaction. had all three on the same uh, 
XY axis and just ask which was which, just based on the shape of the curve. And I was confused because they, you know, I'm assuming always your intermediate will be the second, the second highest curve. Um, but you're saying maybe not. It, it, it'll always be like, um, it'll always be in the middle, first of all. It'll always be, that's why it's called an intermediate. Um, but I'd have to see it. Um, before we, yeah, before we... I do that, yeah, before okay. I do that, um, anybody sure. else have any other questions? Um, yeah, and um, Chris, if you could share the group me link in the chat. Thank you. Actually, you're already on it. Good job. Thank you very much. Um, okay, anybody, any other questions? I'm gonna stop the share. Anybody have any other questions? 